All right, so brass prep, where do you start? Just give us the whole okay. rundown. <laughs> um, real simple. You know, when I first started, I would buy all kinds of Lapua 220 Russian cases, like a lot of people, and I would put out uh, a piece of masking tape on my reloading bench with the scale, and I would sit there and weigh cases and segregate them by weight, thinking that, you know, this is the holy grail, mm -hmm. and cases within a tenth, two tenths, are going to shoot better than, you know, uh, cases that might be uh, two grains, you know, difference in weight, uh, uh, just a minuscule difference. And after a lot of testing, uh, I've had friends that have tunnels, um, really could not see any improvement where you could validate that weighing that case uh, made a difference. And I'll tell you why. This is where people go wrong. Um, I have friends and a lot of friends may do this as weigh their brass. But the problem is you don't know where that weight is with that respective case to case variance. That weight could be in the case head somewhere in the body. So you start segregating brass, but you don't know where that variance in weight might be. Um, now, obviously we make very good brass at Lapua, but uh, you really aren't sure when you start trying to segregate cases by brass, what you're going to improve when you start um, you know, shooting them and things. Um, there's more wind condition out there than any benefit you will see from weighing your cases. Uh, and that's really the bottom line. If people put more time into practice out in the wind, not when it's calm in the morning, you know, they're going to learn a lot more and gain a lot more than really sitting in the basement, re, uh, weighing their different uh, brass to make sure it's all within a tenth or two tenths. It's just not going to improve their shooting. All right. So don't weigh brass. No. <laughs> I quit doing that too. Um, what else? So, 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 so you don't weigh brass, you don't weigh toward brass anymore. Okay. Nope. So you take, you take a piece of brass out of the box or a, a, mm -hmm. you open a box of Lapua 220 mm -hmm. Russian. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you do to that brass? Okay. Um, since I've got like an established headspace, which for our 220 Russian cases is the distance really from the case rim uh, to the shoulder. And with that, uh, my gunsmith, Wayne Campbell, does all my work. He's maintaining a headspace to where literally I can put my barrels on any one of my different rifles without any problem of having to have segregated brass for that specific action. The actions are made that close within, within tolerance. Um, so, and the actions are all very good today, regardless of brand, as far as headspace between different actions. Once I uh, will take a case out of the uh, box, I will take my fire control out of the bolt. I'll put my fire control in a gun, in my rifle, and I will bump that shoulder back slowly uh, in my full length die uh, until I can get that handle to close only about halfway. When I fire form, I wanna make sure that there is no positive headspace. That means that that case is held tightly inside that chamber to where when I'm closing that bolt, I'm making sure that that case really can't move. All right, so once I identify that shoulder bump back on that case, I will use my neck turners uh, to where I will set my cutter to where it lightly touches the shoulder. It doesn't go up the shoulder, it just lightly kisses the shoulder. And you know we can get into that maybe on a future video with some examples. Um, and what I'll do is once I bump that shoulder back, I will bump back all my shoulders for say 30 pieces. I'll make up 30 to 50 pieces of brass for a given barrel depending upon the match size. Um, once I bump the shoulder back, now what I'll do, and this is really important, when people are neck turning brass, once you bump the shoulder back, don't just start expanding the neck and then you're letting that brass sit there. What's going to happen, even if you start neck turning, the first cases you're doing, you've got a nice snug fit, not too tight, but definitely not loose. And this is, you know, in another video, but you do want, uh, you've got to use a carbide mandrel on your neck turner or as that neck turner heats up, you're going to have large variances where your necks are going to get uh, much thinner on your brass 
when that uh, neck turner is heated up. But uh, once I'm neck turning that case, you're going to have a certain feel for it. If I'm ne uh, expanding the necks on all my cases, and I've got cases that have been sitting there for a few hours now before I've gotten to them, those latter cases that have been sitting there, that brass, that neck is expanding, coming back to what it's it was. Contracting, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's springing back to where now when I'm trying to neck turn, I can feel the difference of increased friction. And that is going to really induce a lot more heat from the friction. And it will change your thickness of your cut and cause more inconsistency than you really want. So only expand right before you neck turn that case. I do not expand until I'm ready to pick up that piece of brass and neck turn. Yeah. Um, I've, I've seen that, uh, myself, but for F class, so how many pieces of brass do you prep at a time? Um, I usually do 30 to 50, yeah. uh, depending upon, you know, what match I'm going to. So that's the difference, uh, in F class, right? Like when I prep, I prep a thousand, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's just, a we just have to learn to deal with a lot more variance just right and you're not going to see what we see uh as far as you know we're really our two gun or three gun four guns and our group nationals and larger matches are decided by one ten thousandths of an inch sometimes i mean it when you start stacking up the aggregates and grand aggregates the differences are really really small uh, with the competitive sport that we're in right now. So right. again, we really see some nuances that other shooting ju disciplines just don't quite see. So so you neck turn your breast, you expand it, and you neck turn it, mm -hmm. and then you expand the next one. Do you ever, do you trim your breast at all before you start? No, and that's another thing. I usually, I will wait till maybe three or four firings before I neck turn it. Now, depending upon your reamer, some reamers, uh, in the 6 PPC, 22 PPC, you may have a reamer that has a trim length of 1500. Well, you've got to make sure that before you try to put that brass in the gun before it's fire form, you're going to have to trim it because it's probably going to be at 1503, maybe a little bit longer um, coming out of being neck turned before they're fire form where they're a little bit longer. So it's all predicated on the trim length of the reamer that you're using. You said you wait about three firings before you turn it. Did you mean, did you mean trim I'm it? I'm sorry, before I trim it, not okay, turn it. Okay, yeah. so you turn beforehand, because I assume yeah. your, your chamber's tight enough that you can't, you can't chamber an unturned piece of breast, correct? No, you cannot. No, okay. I'm currently shooting a 268 uh, reamer, but mm -hmm. I've used 262 and 263. And uh, for an example, for my 268 neck, uh, I'll turn my brass to 11 thousandths. So with different bullets, whether it's a flat base that has a pressure ring, uh, that might be, you know, 243.3 on the pressure ring or bow tail that's just slightly over 243.3, I've got plenty of clearance. I know that if there's any issue, it is not because, you know, the brass is just too thick. That's just out of the equation. So... At what point, you discussed about turning a brass too thin. At what point do you think it's too thin? Um, you know, I had a friend of mine that uh, he and his son uh, built rifles, uh, great guys. And, you know, at the time I was, you know, and still today, uh, for larger matches, I would use, you know, newer brass. And, you know, we would go back and forth about nothing shoots better than fresh brass. And that is true. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would shoot his cases, he and his son for a long time. He had uh, turned 100 case necks for he and his son to use at a match. And as it turns out, he loaned his neck turner to a friend. And uh, he had a 262 neck. And he thought that he was cutting his brass to 8.5. Well, unbeknownst to him, his friend, when he borrowed the neck turner, he adjusted it to make a thinner cut without telling him. So when my friend got his neck turners back and made a hundred cases, he and his son went to a range. We're up at Holton, Michigan for the Eastern regionals and both their rifles were shooting great. And he came over to me and says, now I know why you make new brass. Our rifles are shooting great. And later on, he came over to me 
on some cases that he had measured the thickness of the neck. He hadn't fired formed yet. He says, oh my gosh, you'll never believe this. He said, I thought I was turning the brass to be about 8.3 or 8.5 in thickness. And this guy I loaned my neck turners to and adjusted it. The brass is actually less than eight thousandths. It's about six, seven, ten thousandths thinner than what he estimated. He said, now I got to tell you, when I saw the brass be this thin, if I would have known this, I would have thrown the brass away. <laughs> but you made me a believer on this, you know, turning um, thin to win and, and providing a little bit more clearance. I said, yeah, there really is not a downside. I mean, there is diminishing return, certainly, where if you're making the brass super thin, uh, it's not going to seal. So, you know, I make it thin enough to where I don't have a problem and stop there. But uh, again, it's it's just so important to have that uh, clearance. I, ha I had somebody ask me on my website uh, about three days ago on my forum, um, if uh, he wanted to open up his, his chamber neck mm -hmm. because he says he has to turn his necks down to about 12 and a half thousands and that's just way too thin. I said, that is <laughs> not too thin. It's just go, you know, go for it. He was really super worried about that. I said, right. you'll be fine. That's, that's actually quite thick compared to what you guys do. Right. Um, so take the brass out of the box. Mm -hmm. you uh, bump your shoulders. Full length dive, bumping the shoulder back. And, um, and then then right neck before. Turn. Yeah. Oh, you right expand, neck, neck, turn. neck turn. Expand, neck turn. Neck turn. Right. And let me say this when I'm done expanding here. This is so important. And I'm sure you'll identify this. Anyone who's neck turning cases. Um, I will chamfer and deburr the, the mouth of the case. Mm -hmm. And then they go in for a really nice. Uh, Ice bath. Yeah, either acetone or <laughs> lacquer thinner bath. And it's so important to make sure you dry the case and use a Q-tip, not once, but twice, right before I actually am going to fire form and put primers and powder. The cases, just take a Q-tip again. It, I'll tell you, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I mean, we've all done it. You're going to fire form. You go up there and you're pulling the trigger click and you're hitting that primer over and over hoping that it's going to go off. But what's happened is that you had residual oil that was left inside the case that uh, had uh, destroyed the primer. And, uh, you know, it, it's easily preventable, but you do need to go through the steps to make sure you give the cases a proper bath and lacquer thinner acetone, and then uh, do a couple times at least once uh, with a Q-tip to make sure they're oil free. Do you keep your uh, neck turner in, in ice water or anything to keep just, I mean, you're doing 30 cases and you, you leave enough room or not room, but time in between, right? When you're expanding, it just, it just, you're not heating it up. Yeah, no, I'm not doing, you know, certainly the quantity of cases that you're doing, um, you know, but, uh, and I have tried the proverbial keeping the neck turner and uh, in an ice bath. And that just was like a bigger mess than what <laughs> it was. And, yeah, I tried um, that too. And then, uh, but I, I wasn't a fan. You know, the, the real thing too, and believe me, I, I'm as anal as anybody for wanting the best possible necks and turning. I used to turn, I won't tell you how many passes I would make with a Nielsen neck turner to really try to make sure the cases were uh, very, very good. Um, but really the the reality is this, when you fire form that first time, that brass is flowing up that neck. And very quickly, if you were to measure your case necks after a few firings with a good neck checker, you would find that the top of the case mouth gets thicker, the middle of the neck, it gets a little thinner, and the base of the neck is thick. So that brass is not flowing uniformly. So, you know, we are all trying to start with the best possible cases turned to with less than a 10 thousandths of an inch. But after a few firings, believe me, all those, you know, goals and aspirations of having perfect <laughs> necks, the, it, the brass does change uh, with, uh, you know, the gas flow and the uh, brass flow from the gas. Tonight I'm feeling me, gonna make an ugly scene. Tonight.
I am feeling 